and I'm also going to start recording <sighs> now. We can, we can crop uh, the early stuff out later. Okay, we are live. So welcome to um, the Case Tax Advisory Board, a new show for us. I'm going to introduce our first guest and also give a quick introduction to what we're doing here. So to give an, an idea of what um, the advisory board is all about, I, as uh, the CEO of Case Tax, get to be in a really fortunate position, which is I get to talk to um, leaders from across the legal profession, whether they be folks who run law firms, um, folks who run new law companies, um, people at the head of um, in-house counsel at different organizations. And uh, I often get to bounce ideas off and learn tremendously from those conversations. And we decided at case to actually do something a little bit new, which is, first of all, to have these, com these conversations um, public and live um, and to make it open to anybody who wants to listen in, because I think these conversations are oftentimes um, a level more interesting and more in-depth than, than you're able to find in some other traditional forms, um, not all, but, but some traditional forms of media. And the second thing is um, I often have these conversations one-on-one, -on -one, um, sometimes with just somebody who's in-house or somebody who's in the law firm world or somebody that does, who runs a new law company. But I think it would be more interesting to bring these people together and have a conversation across um, find places of common understanding and learning and uh, places where we can, um, you know, see, see places of potentially a disagreement. And in that, in that spirit, we're starting a new show starting today, is the first episode, um, where we will regularly talk to people who are at the top of the profession, the companies, big, small, and in between, um, from all different sides of the legal profession that um, we hope will be interesting. Uh, the tone of this conversation, the tone of this, this talk is going to be more conversational. It won't be a panel. Um, and... Uh, we have certain topics we might cover, but it's going to be a conversation, and we're going to find out uh, where it takes us. I'm joined today by three people who um, I'm really excited to have, who I've, I've turned to in the past um, for I, to bounce ideas off of or talk, talk about product or, or new ventures or what have you, um, and I've enjoyed my, my conversations with each tremendously. Um, joined by Trevor Uffelman. Trevor is currently the general counsel and the chief claims officer at Attic RRG, the American Trucking and Transportation Insurance Company. Prior to that, he was general counsel at Watkins and Shepherd Trucking um, and served an outside counsel role for almost 10 years. Um, great to have you with us, Trevor. Um, Nicole Arbach um, is joining from Elevate Next. Nicole uh, practiced in an outside counsel law firm for 15 years before starting her own firm Valorum Law, um, co-founding their own firm, Valorum Law, that firm focused on challenging the way that business is done as usual at large law firms, um, especially, or law firms across the board, especially in the realm of alternative fee arrangements. And two years ago, um, founded Elevate Next, a law firm that is, um, I, I think, associated with one of the best new law companies out there, um, Elevate. Finally, we're joined by Ralph Baxter. Um, among many, many other things, Ralph has run, uh, you know, worked at Oric Harrington Sutcliffe where he was the CEO and chairman um, and led that firm for a number of years um, and is currently serving in the Stanford Law uh, Center for uh, Center for the, the Future of the Profession. Did I get that right? Um, Close enough. The future of the legal profession. Close yeah. enough. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And also, um, you know, if you are so inclined, I listen to uh, – the, he currently is co-hosting with Bob and Roji the podcast of Law, Technology, Now, and writes um, uh, and also um, uh, writes a new blog that he just began that's excellent is which is um, Legal Services Today. But did I get that one right? Or, yeah. You got the last one excellent. right. Good. Good. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, one for three ain't bad. So, um, so it's really good to have you guys here today. And um, the conversation is going to be about the, you know, how the legal profession will respond in wake of the COVID crisis. Um, and also, uh, I'll, I'll start by asking one question to you all, but I hope that we kind of just take the conversation from here. And the question is, um, the, to maybe kick things off, you know, we saw in 2008, 
when the economy hit uh, a major snag, things changed um, in some ways pretty considerably, in some ways not that much. And uh, I'm curious, you know, how do we think that the uh, legal profession will react to the um, the current economic conditions that in the wake of the COVID crisis? Do, what, what do we think will change? What do we think won't change? And uh, maybe just to kick it off, I want to kick it over to Trevor, who's on the client side. Um, I'm curious if you think, you know, you might be hiring people differently, looking at bills differently, um, thinking about the uh, use of different organizations to provide services for you. Or do you think um, things will mostly stay the same? Curious what your reaction is. My I think two things. I mean, obviously, the economy is what, what's happening now with the contraction of GDP is going to have in implications for obviously the insurance business, the trucking business, et cetera. So I'm already hearing from uh, shareholders and board members of our organization that are uh, concerned about uh, cost management. And for us, uh, legal spend is one of the largest line items in our uh, income statement on any given year. I mean, it, it is it is a big number and all eyes uh, are attracted to it. Um, so, you know, not necessarily virus related, but basically economy related, we're going to be, there's going to be enormous pressure on people like me to effectively manage our costs. And the way we do that, I mean, it's, it's going to, I think it's just going to magnify things that we've already done. So our organization has deployed legal uh, tool, uh, cost management tools, uh, electronic bill review. We use a product called Simple Legal, for example. So increased reliance on that. Um, there's going to be, uh, you, you know, interfacing with our law firms. Um, I'm not going to expect any requests for increased fees, for example, or increased hourly rates. Um, but one thing that I, I can really see happening is we're going to need outside counsel to get real creative about exit strategy. And, in litigation, which is 95% uh, of what I spend um, my legal budget on is, is litigation. So getting creative about exit strategies and getting uh, you know, the real value of a case determined quickly and then doing what needs to be done with our opponent to, get, to extract ourselves from the case. Really interesting. I mean, Ralph, having led a major law firm, I'm curious that you hear you know, uh, someone in Trevor's position say that we're going to need folks to get creative on that kind of a question. I'm curious, curious your reactions to that, you know. Um, well, my reaction to what Trevor said is, uh, thank God you guys will say stuff like that. This, the, you know, law, here, here's a sort of context framework idea. Law is more important than it's ever been, ever. People worry about where's the business, and, and uh, the, the declining market share of the AMLO 100, but it, law is more important than ever before. That's good news. It's a very stable profession. On the other hand, what Trevor said is, is right. It's a bigger and bigger part of, of, of a company's spend. If you're an insurance company in particular, if you've got litigation like Trevor referred to in particular, but it's a bigger part of the spend. And so it's going to be examined more critically and it should be. Law firms can deliver, every lawyer, pretty much in the country, can deliver legal service more efficiently if he or she puts his or her mind to it. And the pressure from the clients will increase. I'm not, I have no doubt it's going to increase as we come back from this uh, pandemic because everybody's been under economic pressure themselves. They've got challenges to begin with, getting back into the swing of the business and, and dealing with all of the costs of the pandemic. And so they're going to be even more, more focused. I think the law firms, on the other hand, have a gigantic opportunity. Uh, we can talk more about this, but I just let me start by saying this. The law firms learned, the big traditional law firms in particular, learned they could operate really differently during, uh, during this pandemic. Someone said to me recently, it was as though somebody had pulled a fire alarm and everybody left the building because it was pretty much overnight. Everyone went remote which Oric did, you know, we opened here almost 19 years ago. We opened this center in West Virginia where I am today to be able to do things remotely. But, it, but at any rate, and everybody went remote six, seven weeks ago and it's worked. And, and the main learning 
for, for big law is that it can work in a very different way. And so as when the time comes for the law firms to return to whatever their new normal will be, they will be informed by this experience and liberated by it, I think. Really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I actually don't want to uh, play moderator too much. I'm curious if you guys have questions for each other. Um, yeah, well, or have a reaction to that. <laughs> I'll jump point. in if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, please do. Yeah. Little, well, I'm I, I'm laughing in part because um, you know Ralph, when you said like particularly big law learned, that's where I sort of laughed, like at those two those two concepts together. I, I'm I'm saying <laughs> that from a from a place of affection here because I came from 15 years in big law and, and have have really had a great experience, but recognize a lot of the issues in learning and changing right. quickly. Um, those are not two two concepts that happened. You know, it, it, I, I think the idea that people have moved to remote that's great, but they didn't have a choice in in large part, and that's right. usually when we see a lot of change being driven in the legal industry. So I think this is, this is very similar. Um, but back to, Tre you know, to Trevor's statement, you know, from the standpoint of the client, and then my perspective, which is a you know, new, new model, if you will, combination of law firm plus a law <clears throat> company, which is a totally unique model, um, what we're hearing is exactly that and more. Like customers not only are going to be faced with drastic legal spend, but drastic legal cuts, and yet on top of that, a lot of increased volume of work. So there's, there's no choice but to do things way differently. And the question is going to be, you know, how radical are people willing to be? And, and when I use that term, I don't like to make it seem like anything that we are doing is actually radical. But for people who are used to, you know, thinking that innovation is learning how to use different subject lines in email to make them more readable, you know, that's the level of innovation, you know, or little, little tiny steps. Yeah, that's not, that's not going to cut it anymore. And I agree with Ralph. The opportunities are incredible. Yeah, I want to I want to kind of ask you something about that, Nicole. Which is, you know, I think 2008 was a, was a it's pretty recent. He started a firm in the midst of that, or he started a firm in 2008. Yeah. Um, and on the one hand, you might look at that experience as well. Um, you know, a massive economic shutdown um, uh, to a degree that we hadn't seen for many years before that. Um, you know, we had like, like, you know, major banks, um, going bankrupt. Um, you had some law firms laying off a lot of people. I was graduating law school around then. So I was on the receiving end of some of that too. Right. It, it hit the legal profession pretty hard and some things did change. I think that the new law companies, um, you know, had, a, I think a rise at the time, um, where, as where they had been perceived at the time, at least from, from, from my perception on the outside, I'm curious if this, this kind of complies with your understanding, but they were kind of perceived a little bit on the outside and they became much more of like a part of doing business, especially for some um, legal organizations. And e-discovery wasn't as big, you know, then as it is now, I think also in reaction. So there definitely were some changes, but on the other hand, sometimes it feels like the more things change, the more things stay the same, right? We're still working on the billable hour to the most part. I mean, obviously your firm challenged that. We're going to build around the most part. Um, your know, work is structured very similarly. You still have roughly the same number of people at the same number of firms. Um, uh, I'm curious, you know, if, if things don't change, why would that be? You know, because um, I think, I think we're, we're all kind of expecting them to change. We're kind of expecting them to change. Then too, I wonder. I wonder if maybe there there will be reasons why things kind of stay stagnant. Um, what's the what's the the other side potentially, or you know, what is that? Is that we're not seizing opportunities to make change happen fast enough, or or you know, yeah. what, what explains that? Yeah, I'll I'll tell you from you know more than ten years of experience of trying to drive change. Um, there's a couple different angles to it. So number one, I just think believe it or not, the legal profession is so risk averse, even though often people think, oh, lawyers are the ones making changes in the law, but truthfully, most lawyers are risk averse. And that and, and that's number one. Number two is inertia is really easy. Um, and a lot of what we're talking about doing 
seems like it's a lot of effort. In reality, I will tell you, because I practice it every day, and I work with this global law company that does this every day easily, but I think in the mindset, it seems like, wow, that's massive change, and that's going to be a massive investment, not just personally and time, but cost when it really isn't. And so I think it's easier to just say, hey, this has worked for so long, we can continue to do it. And it's really only when change is coming from a number of different directions. So your analogy to 2008, I think, is great for me because I started, as I said, at a, at a large law firm where the billable hour was king. Um, and I left to start a firm with others to bring a totally new model at the time, alternative fee arrangement, to the marketplace for litigation in particular. And when I was leaving, people called me and said, you know, hey, don't ruin your career. Like, really, stop and think, what are you doing? Because no one's ever going to talk about alternative fee arrangements. And, and while I agree that today still people are billing by the hour, but if you ask, you know, and you Google alternative fees and any website of any law firm in the U.S., you're going to see that they say they do it. And the number of clients who say they're using them is is significantly more than 10 years ago. But what really drove anybody to talk about AFAs was the economic recession. It was a force. It was a catalyst. And so I look at that time period and I say, this is the exact same thing. People are not going to have a, cha a choice. They can't discount their way out of this one. And, the, and they really are going to have to start embracing all the new things that are out there, like, you know, invoice review that Trevor was saying, but it's the use of technology. It's, you know, consulting. It's, it's looking at portfolios, using AI. It's all of the things that, you know, all the legal innovators are trying to bring to the market right now. So, so if I could, I, I um, let me just confirm one thing and maybe challenge another. But change is hard, and law firms, mm -hmm. um, law firms, lawyers, are resistant to change for for a lot of reasons. Some of which are good, and some of which are like subconscious, but they are. But Jake, you said everybody's expecting the law firms to change. I, I don't think they are. I, I and in fact, history history tells us that law firms change very slowly, even in, even in the 2008 crisis, which was very different from this one. I'm going to take a moment on that. But in 2008, when it was all over, the firms pretty much went back to doing what they did. And there were more alternative fees, but the, there, weren't the, there wasn't the big up uh, draft upswing that, that you might have expected. And so if, if, if we just go on history, I don't think we will expect change. But I think this is going, is going to be different but, but the most important thing for us all to, to sort of uh, accept is that we're gonna find out. We don't know, and that's, that's the key to this, this uh, pandemic. There's more uncertainty than I've ever experienced in my life, and that's, and that's a long time, we, 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 ever. This, and this isn't a financial crisis at heart. This is a health crisis. This started with a health crisis, and the health issues in this will be with us for the next several years. It won't go away. We talk about when it, we go back to whatever we go back to, but the health, the virus is still going to be a risk for some time ahead and people's feelings about it will continue to be. There's a financial piece to this and there's a political piece to this. So there's uncertainty about what the rules are going to be about what you can do. All of that makes this different. And then the other thing is that we had these people, everybody went remote. And, and Nicole, you're right. The law firms didn't choose that. They didn't think innovate, let's go remote, but it happened. And so there really was a moment when everybody left the building and then they operated in a different way, even though it's, it, it's not necessarily that fundamentally different, it's different physically. And that's what I think is, is going to be uh, a significant catalyst to change. But the real agents of change in what's coming are the other two entities represented in this discussion. If, if the new uh, models for delivering legal service play their cards right, make the most of their opportunity, that's going to change the, change the competitive landscape. And even more important, if Trevor and his uh, colleagues have exercised their buying power, that'll drive change too. And that's where the, I think the energy for change, and I, I'm, as we'll talk about, I'm quite optimistic about 
how well the leaders of the law firms get these things and, and how, um, how much more thoughtful they're being this time than, than the last time. But that'll only do so much. Competition drives change. And the more the buyer is uh, insistent on the kinds of things Trevor already has said, and the more Nicole and others create better mousetraps, the, the, the faster the law firms have changed. Yeah, and I'd, I'd, just to, to piggyback off what Ralph just said, I mean, we are on the ground right now working to identify using various metrics, the law firms that we get the best value from, whether it, uh, from, what, from a variety of different perspectives. And so what we're actually doing is consolidating work into firms. So, you know, in certain jurisdictions, uh, for example, for me, Texas is the busiest jurisdiction. We're, we're consolidating cases in, in a handful of firms where we might have done business with 15 or 20 firms um, three years ago. We're finding which ones really meet our needs it's competitively. And I, and I really think with the, the, the end of the COVID or at least the, the heat of the COVID economic crisis, it is really for legal services, I think, a buyer's market. We have a lot of choices. There's a ton of competition in the, the legal services business. So there's going to be, uh, to, to Nicole's point, a lot of pressure for alternative fee arrangements. Um, consolidating work gives us an opportunity to, I think, discuss that in a more real way than if you're you know, sending cases to firms on a one-off basis. Um, so those will be, I mean, I, I think those, when we, when this is all said and done, and if there are law firm failures as there was in 2008, um, you're going to see the guys that end up, I think, being successful are the folks that were able to kind of adapt. Um, we're open-minded about different ways of doing business. And like I said earlier, I just create creative about uh, solving clients' problems um, rather than uh, what I call kind of like checklist practice of law. You, you kind of do what you got to do when you get a case in the door or whatever. Um, where we're looking really for, you know, can we circumvent a lot of the extra work and get right down to the, to the nitty gritty and get accomplished, you know, what our business goals are ultimately. Right. Why right. is it that consolidating work uh, drives the potential for alternative fair arrangements? I'm going to kind of dig in on that um, because that, that struck me as really interesting. Um, is it, is it about the kind of the predictability? Um, I'm actually curious to hear about from Trevor and Nicole's perspective. Super interesting. Uh, I'll be with you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, from my perspective, um, predictability is is key. Um, but what we find, you know, as a guy who looks at a lot of legal bills on a monthly basis, um, what I what I find is the the hourly rate is so subjective. You know, what what might take, you know, uh, let's like say a motion for summary judgment that might take one lawyer forty hours to draft, you know, may take somebody who you know, graduated from Stanford 20. And, you, you know, so there's a, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a, there's a, there's a ton of subjectivity. And, you know, a guy like me, and I, I try to run my legal department off of metrics. I hate that. I mean, like, you know, I've got apples and apple, you know, two, two tasks that are basically the same and two different law firms are taking vastly different amounts of time to do it. And then I have to go have uncomfortable conversations about bills. And so, I mean, th there's, there's a lot of that going on and, and trying to eliminate that, which is where I think alternative fee agreements potentially have some real value um, is, is critical uh, to, to what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I would, I would say that consolidation, I think a lot of clients look to that for the first basic reason of what Trevor said, when you have a hundred firms all doing totally, all doing somewhat of the same thing totally differently at totally different rates, it's very hard to get your arms around what's going on and how can you bring some consistency to that. And from my perspective as a lawyer who, you know, we are especially focused on the business as usual type of matters and portfolios of them. Because when you consolidate those in one firm or a couple of firms, you can, pro you can set a process that's followed so that there's consistency across your providers, There's, there, you can take a look at the process, you can identify the areas of waste, which is where I think that clients really need to be focused and are not focused at all. And, and you can also show trends, you can bring technology and other things to bear, you can right size or you know, put the right people in place at the right cost um, by looking across that, 
that portfolio and consol consolidating things. So the opportunity to sort of really look holistically, I think it is, is greater when there's less firms, less differences in, involved. Um, and I think that that's, I think that that's really important. And then getting to the, to the issue that you talked about, the checklist of how do you handle your litigation, you know, clients in general don't do two things. They, they really don't have any robust early case assessment and resolution, even though ultimately they know that they want to resolve cases. Often they let their firms drive that, and the firms have no incentive to settle things earlier, quite frankly. Um, you can do that in an alternative fee a lot better, and you can build incentives into your fee model, which I recommend. Um, but separate and apart from that, they also never, never seem to get around to looking at prevention. And the only way that you're going to you're going to really drastically reduce the amount of work that you have is by trying to identify the root cause of that work so that the next case is prevented. And we find that clients have not, you know, have not really adhered to that and that there's a huge opportunity just in focusing on that. All right, Nicole is really getting into the, the big picture issues. I mean, that last thing, if, if you want to economize as a, as a client, it's prevention, right? As Richard Susskind says, you'd rather pay for a guardrail at, at the top of the hill than an ambulance at the bottom, uh, <laughs> right? And, and, and it's way better some of the greatest opportunities for, for the client to save money are in A, prevention, right? Thinking about your business practices. Trevor, you said something that's so bedrock for any lawyer. You don't really have legal issues. You have business issues. I mean, you do have legal issues. You're a lawyer, but, but the company has business issues. And then the law is implicated making deals and, and, and having disputes. But you're trying to solve for a business issue. And, and so prevention, doing what you do differently, getting advice from your lawyers who've helped you through the disputes can be a way for you to save way more money than around the edges on, on, the, on the fees. The other thing is containing disputes. So Nicole, you talked about early resolution, but just the whole idea, we're, we're going into this dispute and how can we get, do this in a way that gets an outcome that is acceptable to us, but doesn't spend more than we have to spend. One of the things that I've been encouraging all law firms to do, including the one that I, I was in for 40 years, is to have a service model in which the first thing you do is pin down what is the objective of the client? What are you solving for? What is Trevor trying to achieve? And second, what are the stakes? Because once you know what the stakes are, and, and mostly they're monetary, but sometimes they're, they're other, they have reputation, liberty, different things in different cases, but once you know what the stakes are, then you know, you can start to think about how much should we spend and how much should we expect the client to spend to get that objective achieved? And that, I mean, that, that's a, a, a building block about ways to do this. One other thing I'd like to share is, is this. Uh, when you have a set of cases that are of relatively the same kind, and, and uh, Trevor, I'm betting that you have a lot of cases that are just variations on a theme in, in your, right? Um, when you have that kind of set of case, if you're the law firm, you can then price way more uh, reliably, predictably for your client because you're going to, they all kind of go the same. They vary different ways, but they kind of go the same. You can look at your own data. You can see what it has cost you to do a case of that kind. And then you can bid, you can bid a fixed fee. I would, if I were your lawyer, I'd just give you a fixed fee for the thing. If you were going to give me a significant share of your matters. And on some of them, I'd end up losing money in, the, in comparing the cost to do what I did for what you paid me. And on some of them, I'd make money. And on balance, you'd be happy and the, and the law firm would be happy. But that's the key to it. Putting the law firm in a position to price uh, in a way that, that is adequately predictable to you. Although, Nicole, you are so right that there are so many ways when you look at your portfolio of cases for you to do everything the client wants in a way that is more efficient from your end and, and, and all the things you said. And when you do that, you also create a more rewarding career for the lawyers because you allocate the work in a way that actually then fits to what the individuals find uh, rewarding and you know, they like to do. 
Well, uh, on the subject of preventing legal problems in the first place as a way of saving money, uh, the COVID-19 virus has had the impact as on our property casualty business of reducing claim volume by almost 30%. <laughs> which is gonna have a- <laughs> Mission accomplished. I, I, it, it's, it's, that's positive for us, but it's, I can see for the, our outside firms, it's gonna need for litigation and the, the people that thrive on contingency fees and bring, bringing the litigation are gonna be struggling real fast. Yeah. Don't worry, they're just gonna turn around and sue you, sue the insurance companies for for not covering their loss of business. So there'll be plenty of other work to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny how that ups uh, and flows. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was wondering actually, I mean, besides besides COVID, I mean, it seems like there are some businesses for whom it is easier to build in prevention than others. Like you're thinking about the, I'm guessing the kinds of lawsuits that trucking organizations are typically involved in, actually like accidents, you know, um, uh, tr trucker driver fall, falls asleep at the wheel or allegedly does, right? And that's like a, becomes a, a, a wrongful death or, or injury kind of lawsuit. I wonder, I mean, how, how involved are you and, and how involved is Attic in trying to help prevent those kinds of things? Is, are there ways? Um, or other yeah. ways, are there maybe micro, micro strategies once litigation's begun to kind of prevent it from spiraling out of control? Or I'm curious, what your, what your reaction to that as it applies to your business? Well, we, we're a um, we're a captive insurer, so we're owned by uh, a collective of companies that um, uh, that one large, they're large, sophisticated trucking organizations with you know some of them have uh, over a thousand trucks, for example, I and mean, they're significant businesses. Um, and they own, uh, you know, a portion of our business and they also retain a lot of the risk for any given accident. So there's a lot of incentive for, for prevention. So we, um, as part of the underwriting process, we do, uh, you know, like, a, for example, all of our, all the trucks that we insure are, have, uh, forward and rear facing cameras, for example. Um, we, we, we try to work with our insureds on um, safety practices that are good. There are technologies that are in some trucks that prevent driver fatigue. There are AI technologies that actually can, with the cameras that can detect when a driver's getting sleepy and then alert them to, to, uh, to wake up or it shakes the seat. So there's a lot of things we're actively involved in. Our company subsidizes the cost of some of those to our, our members because it's critical. It's really critical for the, success of our company. Our reinsurers expect us to be actively involved in it. And so um, for us to be successful and uh, on the loss side, we, we're, we have, it, you know, leveraging technology training, you know, trying to find drivers that are safe um, is, is essential to making sure that our insurance organization is successful. So there are, there are totally ways, I, I was assuming actually that your response would be different, but there sounds like there are totally ways even we were talking about things like accidents that, um, and this is not even a legal question anymore, right? It's to say, how can we prevent the cause of all these litigations? And it looks like there are ways for, for you guys to do that yeah. pretty effectively. That's cool. Yeah, if you're yeah, active, yeah, and I think, you're going to make the investment, there's lots of things that we can do. Yeah, I think you can do that across the board in pretty much at any industry. Sometimes it's more legal in the sense, so for example, what we see all the time is, there is a standard contract, sometimes that, you know, the template went through legal review hundreds of years ago, but it was, it's a two-page contract that is being used thousands and thousands of times, and there are certain clauses that just aren't holding up in litigation, but nobody is tracking that data. They're not collecting it. They're not checking with the various law firms that they're using, and they don't realize that this clause is really very ambiguous and it's causing a lot of, it, of issues. Um, and if you just look back, you do an after action assessment every time you handle a matter or a por portfolio of matters, and you work with the client, those could be easily um, solved. And it's the same with, you know, it happens in every different, you could say employment litigation, right? Where are, are these multiple claims coming? Well, there's an issue with this manager, right? There, you know, there's, some coincidences here that aren't coincidences. Let's take a look at that. It's very hard when you're a lean law department and you're constantly reactionary, and you're putting out flat fires, you don't have time to take a step back. So you need to look to outside providers who can do that, who can do it cost effectively and build it into the fabric of 
of what you're doing because it is the most substantial way to reduce your cost. Yeah, I think, I think more and more the role of the in-house law department, and of course it depends on the nature of the business and, and how big it is, is to in, in assure or do everything it can to assure that what the company is doing is, is in a way that minimizes the legal risk. There's always going to be challenges and so on. But as you said, Nicole, spotting the ambiguity in the agreements and, the, and so on. The, 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 I won't do this justice, but the, um, the way Mark Chandler describes the role of the legal department at Cisco is to enable uh, the company to do what it wants to do in a way that complies with the law or something like that. He puts it better than that. Right. You know, often the law department is regarded internally as the naysayers. They, they do, oh, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. And, and which is not, that's not helpful either. Um, and, and Mark correctly has found a way to express this in the affirmative. But, but um, so I think it's the role at one way or another of any general counsel in-house uh, law department. But the experiences that Nicole's sharing are exactly right. When you've done a case, something did go wrong. We had a dispute and now we're done. Let's, let's take a look. So how might we have avoided that? And, and, you, and you're closer to the facts right then than you'll ever be. And then you'd already paid the tuition for, <laughs> for that education. And, and one of the other things that I have to mention, because we have a, a very close dear friend, former client, um, who beats this into, into our minds constantly, but, you know, it, that the law department really shouldn't just be the cleaning crew of all the business issues that come to light, right? That, that there are certain things that the law department should be focused on, but there's a lot of things that the businesses should be focused on, and particularly in contract review. You know, there's only a few clauses from the legal standpoint that are going to make a difference to the, the company as a whole, but many of them are going to make a difference to the businesses, and yet they funnel those up where those should really be residing with the businesses. So it's not only just preventing the next thing from happening, but it's putting back the right things with the businesses so that they're making the decisions that they then have to carry out and that they see the consequences of that. And that too should eliminate some of the work that's being funneled up to the law department. Yeah. I heard somebody describe a law department as a wet blanket once, and I thought, oh, well, that, hope that doesn't apply to me. <laughs> well, well, I want to say, you know, one of the nice things about doing this live and um, we're streaming it to Twitter, Facebook, um, YouTube, and people are sending in comments. And I, I actually want to um, switch the conversation a little bit, but it's something I've been interested in as well. Someone wrote in, say you're a law student and you're graduating right now, right? Um, you just didn't attend your graduation ceremony in person, presumably, right? You're, um, you may or may not take the bar exam, but after all of that, um, after all that craziness that's said and done, you know, for people who are, who are charting out a new career right now, do we think that the world will look much different than it might have uh, just a year ago or two years ago? And would you, would you now having gone through legal careers, and I, I think I was supposed to mention at some point that, that each of the folks here have some connection to the Catholic University um, so, uh, uh, Trevor and Ralph directly and Nicole through was it a family member or friend. Um, uh, so, uh, each, you know, they are graduating from the Catholic university school of law right now. Um, what, what advice would you give to a fellow, uh, alumnus Trevor, uh, you know, um, heading into this legal market? Um, gosh, that's a tough question. It, I, I wouldn't want to be coming out of this. I, this is discouraging. I feel like I, yeah, I maybe am a wet blanket because um, <laughs> <laughs> this is just such a tough. Uh, this has got to be the toughest market, um, legal market. I, I, you know, firms are, are already. I'm reading stories anyway that firms are uh, are already letting go internally. I'm just sure hiring is being frozen. Um, I think my advice would be um, an open mind about what you want to do uh, and. Take, seize opportunity where it, where it may be found, whether or not it's what you dreamt of doing when you were, you know, entering your first um, your first year of law school, and you had you know dreams of becoming a civil rights lawyer or whatever. I mean, maybe you want to do family law for a while uh, until everything heats back up. But right now, just the 
the uncertainty and and the speed with which this crisis has uh, come on, I, I think everybody, our company, a lot of others are are just kind of like, let's wait and see. Let's not do anything. Let's wait and see. Let's um, extend employment um, offers, uh, you know, push them out a little bit so that we can we can see what the recovery is going to look like. I don't know. It's 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 tough, um, and and so that's you know not real encouraging, but. You know, to be cliche, we're going to get through it, it but it, it's probably going to require an open mind and some flexibility. It's funny because when you say no. open mind and what's available, it sounds like you're lowering, lowering expectations. <laughs> um, let, uh, let me try and no, make them, let, me, let me try and make them feel a little bit better, right? I'll, I'll okay. Be the, okay. Sort of, you know, glasses twice as full. Um, Look, these are totally unprecedented times, and it's terrifying everything that's going on, you know, from a personal standpoint. But it's really a great window of opportunity. And I look at this generation; they are so adept at, you know, technology, which from is difficult, I think, for for some of us a little bit older, um, to figuring out, you know, virtual and remote work. That's second nature. That's what they did. They they are far more adept at sort of changing conditions. And so I think just expand your horizon of the type of work that you should be looking at. So again, shameless plug for the company that I'm affiliated with, but one of LLA's biggest things is a, is flexible resourcing. And I think that that's where a lot of companies who are cutting their own attorney and staff to lower their overhead, but yet they still have this influx of work. They're going to turn to staffing companies in order to, um, to bridge that gap. And so it, I think that's one of the first places that I would tell anybody. And while it seems like it's temporary or project-based, a lot of these are actually long-term assignments that will give you real opportunities in real companies that when there's openings may translate into a, a permanent job. So that's the first thing I would say. I would say look at law companies in general, alternative providers, because they do so many things inside law departments and law firms. Law firms are really looking to alternative service providers and law companies so that they can be competitive as Ralph is saying and they can survive. And so there's a lot of opportunities if you're adept at um, you know, legal operations or you're adept at technology or you're willing to learn and, and you have an open mind about it. So don't just think government law firm um, as your sole sources of um, of work, and finally, I will say that there is such a tremendous need for nonprofits. I mean, not only were they always um, looking for help because their budgets were low to begin with, but if you are finding that you can't get a foothold and you have the ability to do some pro bono work or to do some volunteer work for a, a not-for-profit for access to justice during this time, please take advantage of that because you'll hone your skills you'll be giving back to people. And I think in the end, it will serve everybody well. So I, I agree with Nicole and, and, and Trevor completely about this. I have a little experience at it because I have a daughter, my middle daughter is a third year law student. So we, okay. I've been vicariously going through this whole process with her all the way through the recruiting. I got to see what the law firms look like from, from the viewpoint of, uh, of a very worthy uh, candidate for employment, and now I've I've been uh, talking to her about how she feels as she is just as you said missing her graduation because there is no graduation going to class you know online for the final term, and context is everything. Just one I, I agree with everything that's been said. So part of it is what do you want to do, and that which which is the question every law student should be asking herself himself to begin with. But so and and then. Because the, as I said before, law is more important than ever before. And you can't, we can't lose sight of that. We, there are ebbs and flows in, in different kinds of demand, but it's in everything, in everybody's life. It's in everybody's business, every organization. Part of the reason we have such a great uh, crisis in access to justice is there's, it's in everybody's personal life. And, and people who don't know the first thing about law and don't have enough money to hire any law firm uh, have have problems, but so what do you want to do? What what is it that made you want to be a lawyer? What would you find rewarding? And don't ever lose sight of that. When you get if you were were to one thing, if you were to go to a law firm, 
And when you get there, I did this, I actually lived this. You get there and you don't like anything they do. Well, then go somewhere else, do something else or start your own department or do something, pursue what you want to do. But that said, if you do want to be, I haven't really talked much about big law. I do want to put some two cents worth in here for big law because um, it will always have a role. I think it's role is going to be different and, and all the data is showing you that it's going to be different in, in the legal landscape, but it's going to be still very significant and important and very desirable depending on what you want to do. And I think for someone coming out of law school today, it's really a great time for reasons, some of which Nicole just said, there, the world work is going to be done differently. I mean, I, I said history tells us not to expect it, but I think it, this time is going to be different. And I do think that the, mm. the, the uh, digital natives that the new generation are, the, the ease with which they will deal with change and deal with technology is going to be a huge advantage for them. Uh, the, 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 the law firms are going to change how they do their work. And, and it's going to be easier if you're starting up than the other way. And I think part of what's coming in uh, the way the changes that are going to come in law will include more flexible working, even in working hours, working time expectations, even in the largest, uh, most profitable law firms. And, and that's far more appealing to the most recent class of graduates from law school than it would have been in my day where we I didn't think personal life was an option. So, yeah, it's interesting. I, I was reflecting on the question a little bit, and you know, I I happened to graduate, or I graduated in law school in 2010. So it was right around when um, we were still definitely feeling the after effects of uh, Lehman Brothers. I actually remember the day that Lehman shut down. I think it was the day of my on-campus recruiting. You know, uh, at, uh, at my law school. And one of the things that I noticed, I mean, this is true of myself, but also true of a lot of my peers at my law school and other law schools, is you saw this kind of um, mini explosion in new legal technology companies happen right around then, too. And um, not, it wasn't because we didn't have other options. A lot of us, you know, had worked at firms or had the opportunity to work at firms. Uh, but I think all of a sudden, uh, it became clear, at least some of us, that things were kind of broken the way they were, and uh, there could be... The things that we're doing that were taking way too long or way too painful when we got into practice or during our summer internships that seemed like obvious applications of new technologies, uh, for example, or um, I don't know. I mean, it, might, it might be that one of the things we see out of this for law students is um, whether it be a legal technology company, if that's your bent or something else entrepreneurial, um, you know, either by choice or, um, you know, because you're, you're kind of have to, um, you know, I think you might see a lot of uh, innovation uh, and, <laughs> Right. I think that might happen as well. There's no question. And there's, in all the different ways, Nicole, Nicole is, is, is aimed at innovating. All of Elevate and, and the new firm, are all aimed at innovating. Trevor's determined to do this better, find a way to do it so that it, it's done with meeting all the objectives in, in a more efficient way. New companies are springing up. New tech, legal technology companies are springing up uh, day in and day out. There, that's another career opportunity for people who graduate from law school. If you have a law degree and you, you understand law and you care about law, you can make a very significant contribution when someone is starting Lex Machina or Ravel Law or Case Text. It, you know, those companies uh, need people who both get the technology but also get the law. If you, so totally agree I, I with think, that, yeah. yeah. Right? The, the one thing I, I didn't get really a chance to say before about how law firms are thinking about this. Uh, I've spent, I spent a, lo a lot of time over the last few weeks uh, talking in detail with leaders in law firms about how they're feeling about it. And I've written a fair amount on my, uh, my blog posts about what law firms, what I think they ought to do. And I've been struck by how thoughtful, and, and this is one way in which this feels different to me from 2008. 2008 was a financial crisis. At Oric, we had one of the leading uh, world market shares in, in, a, in the securitizing assets. And that was at the heart of, of what went down in the crisis. So it, there was a drastic reduction in demand for our legal services and what we had to do. We had to solve for that. It was a financial um, event that you couldn't, you couldn't not notice. This one's really different. And it's, it's different as, as we were talking about earlier because there's health questions in it. 
and because there's all these questions of what is permitted or not. And then there's this remote working all of a sudden. What I'm finding is the law firm leaders are being very thoughtful, thoughtful about the outlook of their employees, really thoughtful, not just the associates, but everybody. That's why you see in this downturn, there have been far fewer layoffs and more wage cuts, other things. They have, they have to do something to deal with the economics. And they're, and they're bearing much more of the brunt to the partners. Uh, there's a, a lot of ways in which the, the responses, even on economics, of the law firms are different. But beyond that, the law firms really are, it, it, it's my impression, uh, and every law firm's different, but my impression is the law firms are being more thoughtful about all the issues, including what we are learning. And, and you weren't right to be skeptical, Nicole, about law firms' capacity to learn. You, you know, you weren't wrong about that. But in this time, I do think they are really uh, learning. They are surprised. For example, I believe it's true that productivity per lawyer is up. It didn't go off by working remotely. It went up. Collegiality is better. People are having more meetings, not fewer. People are doing a better job of selecting the right lawyer for a matter. If you're in a great big firm and you have all these people and all these offices and all these practices, you still kind of default more often than is healthy to the person down the hall or the person you know. But in this remote working, people have the technology in front of them. They can see who the right person is and they select the right person. So there's a lot of things that yeah. are out of this that are good. Nicole's right. The law firms didn't volunteer for, you know, to, and nobody wanted the pandemic. But since it has happened, the law firm leaders, I think, are being pretty thoughtful. So you know, one thing I want to add I, to that. Um, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Nicole. Go ahead, please. Uh, all I was going to say is I, I think that's right. I mean, you definitely see that with, with cuts that are being made, but that they stop at a certain threshold, salary, et cetera. And I totally appreciate that. I don't think it's unique to law firms, to be honest with you. Oh. I see companies across the board that are doing their level best to take cuts across, you know, either at the leadership level or across the board to avoid layoffs, furloughs, things of that nature. What I really question and hope, but because everyone says this is going to take longer than we think, is that after things return to, I'd say, you know, the next normal, um, which is coined in part by one of my partners, Pat Lamb, but I think that this is going to last longer. And I think more importantly, the economic impact on certain firms is going to be the driving force. So I do think that it's great that people are looking to try to keep staff. There's going to come a point in time in companies and in law firms where that's probably not going to be possible. But the final thing that I would just point out and, and hope in your work, Ralph, and anybody else who deals with large law firms in particular, is that in the economic downturn, minority and women advancement plummeted. And that's already something that people have been struggling with. It's an issue near and dear to my heart. And I would love to, to take a look at what is the byproduct of any of the cuts that are being made or any of the different way of work and right. to make sure that attention to those issues doesn't fall by the wayside. Right. So absolutely. And we all should be paying attention to that in, in everything we do, but including this. And, 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 and at, at the very minimum, if it turns out that you applied neutral principles to decide who got laid off or who got furloughed, and that ended up having a disparate impact on one group or another, at the very minimum, as you, as you said earlier in the context of learning, you can see that whatever you're doing isn't working right because you've set it up so that when you apply neutral principles, it ends up having that consequence. But one of the things that, that someone said to me recently about uh, I mean, so I, I, I just don't push back at all on what you're saying, but here's, here's some silver lining. Uh, someone shared with me the experience in, that in one big law firm, they were seeing that the flexible work that the remote locations, the remote working ended up advantaging some, some people that worked the other way. The people who have these other things, everybody now is dealing with uh, children to, to uh, care for, which falls more more heavily on women, mothers more often right. than, than men. And now everybody's dealing with everyone's and, and, and so on. 
But you're absolutely uh, right about that. We, we have to be very careful. I, I didn't mean to say that law firms were being unique in this. It's just that the nature of this one has caused them, in my view, to be more in touch with the human issue and more in touch with the possibility of doing better. All those things that you were saying in an earlier uh, answer, uh, ob observations about how much more efficiently we could do this, they're more in touch with it now because it's happened right in front of them. And, and, then, and, and everyone's experience dealing with each other. Someone said to me recently, it, it's, it, you'll never w see a client the same after you've had a conference call and she was in her pajamas or the, the, the child walked in or the pet walked in. It just, it changes things in a way that was accidental, but still happened. Well, one thing I wanted to say on uh, a point Rob was making a little bit earlier about law firm leadership during this time, um, for those who haven't listened to it already, um, uh, Ralph did an interview with the current CEO of Oric, I think his name is Mitch Zuckley, or I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Zuckley, um, Zuckley. Zuckley, yeah, Mitch Zuckley, um, on uh, how Mitch is leading through this time. And I, honestly, I listened to it, and I'm not a law firm leader, obviously. Um, I'm a leader of a technology company, but I thought, that the stuff he was saying was just good leadership advice for any organization, period. Um, I think it's worth listening to 100%. I was like, it was a really, I mean, props to Mitch. He's obviously thinking about things, like you said, in a very, I think it's a really good example of exactly what you were saying um, right. about just, intelligent, compassionate leadership. Right. Yeah, that's it. That's all I got. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, episode because, and I agree with what you just said, it's also, as candid as you're ever going to hear somebody talk about how they dealt with something as complicated and challenging as this uh, and, and granular. Mitch really goes into the details in that episode of what they were thinking about and what they did. And I'm very proud of what they did. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Right, so we only have a few minutes left. Um, and I want to maybe end on, on a kind of interesting note, which is we talked about, you know, how things will change, might things change in the wake of COVID, how things will look different for um, a graduating class of law students. And I'm sorry for, for all the live blue years. Um, I'm actually getting text messages from people I know, and I have not been able to answer those, uh, ask those questions, maybe next time. Um, uh, you know, I'm curious, you know, to put it back on Trevor for a sec, I, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about is um, we've been throwing around words like alternative arrangements, new law companies, artificial intelligence, new technologies. Yeah, I'm curious, um, take your temperature, because you're, you're ultimately the, the one person in this group of people who's going to be making uh, decisions that ultimately matter here the most in some ways, right? Um, you're kind of representing in some ways all, all the clients. But I'm curious your personal your personal opinion is, do you think these are these are things that are really going to take off, um, you know, either in your organization already, in your organization in the future, in other organizations, or or might we find ourselves in five years saying we were talking about all that stuff, but it didn't happen? I'm curious. Um, I'm curious what your, what your perspective is on that. Either way. Yeah, I think we're going to see adoption of new technologies, AI. I'm always looking. I mean, as a guy who sits in my position, I'm always looking for new and better ways do things, technological solutions that can automate something that, you know, can decrease our error rates in, in various areas. So I think it's taking off, you know, I take just to, and not to flood case text, but when I, somebody was telling me about AI drafted briefs, I, mean, I, I would have dismissed that out of hand and you showed them like, that is actually a thing that can really revolutionize uh, the way people practice, it would have changed my life a million percent as a young associate who was doing that kind of work. So yeah, no, I think that we're looking, I mean, the alternative fee arrangement thing that Nicole's been talking about, I mean, that's been a subject, you know, a while now. Um, it's, I think, getting more traction than it would. I think we're going to be seeing more of it as people get comfortable with the economic model, because ultimately, you know, everybody's got to, it's got to make sense. I mean, lawyers have to feed their families and support the overhead and all the stuff that, you know, they need to do. So it's got to be something that makes sense for everybody. But um, it, yeah, I, I, I think that we are embarking on change. I think the economic conditions are going to force it to some degree. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity. So maybe that's an, uh, you know, they throw a bone to our law students who are coming out. There's going to be opportunities to do things in new and various ways. 
big picture, I'll say as a lawyer, um, you know, 15 or 17 years out of law school now, this has been an extremely rewarding career. So regardless of what temporary headwinds we're facing now, um, there's nothing that would have fit me better. So if any law students are out there listening, I mean, th this is a, a high quality profession with, with great people and interesting work. I've never been bored a day in my life uh, coming to work. That's awesome, that's awesome. Any other party thoughts before we have to sign off? Um, I have just one more. You know, one of the things I, that I have been doing since I left uh, uh, Oric uh, seven years ago uh, is serving on boards uh, of legal technology companies like Lex Machina and now Intap. And, I, and I've, I've learned so much about that side of this equation and how much the, the technology companies, Case Text, the, the, the new, uh, the, the, your newest idea, Jake, how powerful they are. And at NTAP, I've, I've learned how much opportunity, what, what Nicole was saying earlier, how much opportunity there is within every law firm to modernize the way they do what they do by simply learning from their own information, learning about their clients, learning about their prior history of doing things. And it, it, it's really liberating to, to be able to see what you've done before, what, what the facts are, and, and, then, and then make progress in the way legal service is delivered. And I think one of the really exciting dimensions of law practice for someone coming out of law school today is this increasing intersection of technology, information technology and automation and all of it in a way that makes legal service more exciting, more fun. And the part that the individual, the human gets to do is the, the kind of activity that, that makes you want to be a lawyer to begin with. Absolutely. Totally, totally. It makes a lot of sense. And thank you, thank you for talking about case studies. I mean, the truth is that you're seeing this across the board, I'd say, in, in the legal technology space. Um, there are a lot of really exciting applications coming out, coming out these days. Um, super, super interesting. Nicole, you want to add any, anything? Um, I will say also, we, no. only one of our questions about the law student, that person really got their question answered. <laughs> I really feel good about that. We'll try yeah. to, next time we do this, we'll try to get, try to get even well, yeah. more of the folks asking um, asking questions in different directions involved. But I think it's, you know, in some ways, I, will, I just one thing to add about that, which is I really do love that we talked about that, um, in part because the, the law student question is in some ways asking about the future of the profession, period, right? Um, and a profession that we're all involved with. And um, I'm, I'm glad that we see so much hope here. You know, I, I put into this conversation not really knowing how I feel about a question like that, to be honest, right? It's a scary time. Yeah. So, Nicole, you're about to say. Yeah, so the, the, I would just end with, first of all, thank you for, for having me. And I think, that, you know, I speak for everybody. This has really been great. I, I do think it's a scary time. I'm sorry that opportunity is going to come on the, you know, on the heels of what is great suffering for a lot of people. And we, we recognize that. But, but there is great opportunity, and I, and I hope that eyes have been opened both from the, you know, in-house standpoint as to what the possibilities are and that there are ways to tackle these issues, and from the law firm standpoint because there's an ecosystem where everybody can work together and there's great opportunity for everybody. And then we thank you, Jake, for all of the things that you guys bring and the technology and new innovators. Don't stop trying to disrupt and don't stop trying to innovate. Um, I love the composed aspect of it, and I can't wait to save, you know, many, many hours of my time coiling away at Breach. So it's all good. I really appreciate that. Well, um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to everybody who's watching live. Uh, you know, it's been really fun to, to watch your comments come in. To, we were to make sure to answer some of them offline probably. Um, this has been fun, guys. Uh, I really appreciate, has been. you know, us participating in the, uh, the, the public open and live advisory board. Um, it's really cool. So, um, Thanks, we're gonna end the recording now. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And we're gonna see if I can do this effectively.